Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for lifespan development, and in it we're looking at the first online quiz for Chapter 6, which is on adolescence. The first question in this quiz is, at what age are children normally able to begin to understand the meaning of x in algebraic equations? So that's the variable x. The choices are 7, 9, 11, and 13. Well, according to uh, most of the research, the answer is 11. So it's about the time that they're going into, uh, say, for instance, for fifth or sixth grade. You know, so here's our little equation. Um, I have kids who are in this age group and they're doing problems like this. 2x minus 2 is equals 28. Uh, move the 2 over. 2x equals 30. Divide both sides by 2. You get x is equal to 15. So that's using x as an abstract concept. And that's one of the things about Piaget's uh, progress in uh, formal operations, the ability to deal with these abstract entities. Now, uh, there is one exception that you still can deal with this as a very concrete thing. When I'm working with my kids, if they don't get it, we start talking about like money or marbles or, you know, M&Ms, and then it seems to work a little better. Okay, question number two. Which of the following requires adolescents to perform mental operations with symbols? Okay, now the choices here are algebra, calculus, geometry, and trigonometry. And truthfully, uh, had I not read the book, I would have thought that all of these required working with symbols like, you know, X, like we had in the last question. Well, the one that gets you uh, credit on the quiz is C, geometry. Now, this is a little weird because it's hard to think of, you know, how it uses symbols differently. But what it really does is it uses very abstract concepts. Now, for instance, uh, let me give you an idea here. Uh, what the book says on page 359 is that the symbols used in geometry, uh, excuse me, symbols used in geometry, adolescents have to work with points that have no dimensions, lines with no width, that are infinite length, circles that are perfectly round, and these things are not found in nature. So again, when we're doing like 2x minus 2 equals 28, we can actually get at the M&Ms and we can count them and we can do it. Um, but in a, an absolutely correct sense, when you're dealing with a point, line, circle, you can't because they are abstractions that, that there's approximations that exist in reality, but nothing exact. So anyhow, that's why geometry gets the correct answer on this one. All right, the next one, uh, question three. Ellen and Paul are working together on a school project where they need to imagine how a set of shapes can be, uh, can be manipulated to create a new shape. The first step is to imagine this in their heads and then put it on paper. Paul is able to do this much uh, quicker, uh, they should say more quickly, by the way, than Ellen. And which ability are they using? Well, um, the abilities that you get to choose from here are imaginary, verbal, visual, spatial, and mathematical. Um, the answer in this case is visual spatial. Now, uh, there are a few different uh, abilities. The other ones are verbal and mathematical, where sometimes there are gender differences. Uh, actually, on verbal, girls and women, uh, almost as a group, generally outperform boys and men. Visual spatial, there's a there's a s advantage at least to some levels for boys and men. And interestingly, uh, there is no consistent difference on mathematical abilities. Um, but I wanted to show you the visual spatial. It's the good old mental rotation, or I call it the, the Tetris task, where you have to see if the two shapes uh, in each of these are the same um, as they go across. Now you can see, for instance, the two at the top left, they're called congruent, which means they're the same shape, and you don't even have to rotate them. But the, And the two on the top right are different, even with that rotation, because the the one on the far right only has one block on top, the one next to it has two. And the, the real problem is, for instance, down here is D. It's, it's, you have to do a fair amount of rotating in your head to tell that those are, in fact, different shapes, that, that they, uh, they don't match. One's left-handed, one's right-handed. Anyhow, um, question number four. Which of the following is thought to help increase the level of moral reasoning in juvenile delinquents? So moral reasoning is a good thing. Question is use of symbolism in a group setting, use of deductive skills, excuse me, deductive reasoning skills in a group setting, use of legal terminology in a group setting, or use of moral dilemmas in a group setting. So obviously group setting is uh, the consistent uh, across this. Well, the answer here is uh, actually the research supports the use of moral dilemmas in a group setting. We've talked about the Heinz dilemma, uh, 
uh, you know, here's another interesting one, the sinking lifeboat. Basically, you have somebody on the boat who's going to die, um, and would you throw them overboard <laughs> in order to save everybody else? Again, it's framed as a, this either has to happen or, or you know, you, you either do this and everybody lives or you don't do this and everybody dies. And, uh, that's an interesting question, and it actually um, makes me think about the life of Pi a little bit. Anyhow, um, that's that question. Number five, which is one reason girls have a more difficult time in middle school than boys? Well, you know, I was not um, generally aware that there was this difference before I read this. Anyhow, they face a gender bias in the classroom. They face less, less ex, excuse me, they face less acceptance from older adolescents. They face less attention from older adolescents, or they face more attention from older adolescents. Well, um, Curiously, the, uh, the answer to this one is they face more attention from adolescents. Specifically, the idea here is that girls are getting looked at in ways they do not like by older boys in school and that uh, younger boys don't face the same problem from older girls. It's, so it's, it's gendered and it's a one-way kind of thing. And in fact, here's an interesting uh, chart. It's from the New York Times. Uh, this, now, this goes from 7th to 12th, so it's a little older than some of what we're talking about. But take a look at the top one. Um, the percentage of girls who report having, it says, having someone make unwelcome sexual comments, jokes, or gestures to or about you, um, let's see, I mean, it's a huge number. It's twice as many as there are uh, for boys. And you see some differences as it goes through, uh, for instance, part way down, being touched in an unwelcome sexual way, much higher for girls than it is for boys. And so that's the kind of attention that you wouldn't want would make things uncomfortable, especially as you're going through puberty in middle school or junior high. All right, question number six. Which of the following tests is often used to determine career interests? Well, your choices here are the Holland Survey, the Neo Peer, the Harder Personality Inventory, or the MMPI. Well, um, most of these are personality tests. The one that, uh, that hooks up directly with uh, vocational interest is the Holland Survey. And we've seen this chart before. We've got these uh, six types here. The top left is, is called C. That's for conventional. And um, it says clerical. They like to uh, order things out. And the top middle is realistic, which we see a bunch of, you know, uh, working with your hands types. Uh, top right, investigative. Bottom left, uh, enterprising. The entrepreneur is really business types. And then we have social, and then we have uh, the uh, bottom right is artistic, where we have a man in his opera cape. Anyhow, um, those are the six categories that come from the Holland uh, test. All right, question number seven. Which of the following careers would go well with someone who is high in a social career personality type? This is based on the Holland inventory. The, uh, so we're looking at social. The idea is accountant, scientist, veterinarian, or nurse. Well, the social um, of these, the one that works best is nurse. In fact, let's take a, a look at a little chart I got from somewhere else about these six types. And I put a big red circle there around the bottom right. Social are the helpers, um, especially like the helping with other people. And so nurse would definitely fall into that category. All right, number eight. Which of the following identity statuses would be most applicable for an adolescent who is exploring his choices but has no commitment or has made no commitment? And the choices are identity achievement, moratorium, foreclosure, and identity diffusion. Well, uh, if they are exploring but have not made a commitment, then the answer is moratorium. Now, it sounds like it means you're dead. What it really means is I'm, I'm working on it. Get back to me later. You may remember uh, this thing that we looked at before, and unfortunately, the uh, having made a commitment <laughs> did not show up on this one. But the people who have made a co commitment are on top row. The people who have not made a commitment are on the bottom row. Moratorium's bottom left. They're exploring but have not made a commitment. They're actively exploring alternatives and, and so forth. All right. Question number nine. Which of the following is characterized by individuals who choose to share activities together rather than choose activities that others share. So the idea here is that you're first picking the activity and then you pick people to do that activity with or as opposed to uh, first picking your friends and then doing whatever you know you guys want together. And the choices here are a click, a 
crowd, a sect, or a social group? Well, that last one's a very vague term. The one we're looking for right here that has a sort of loaded meaning is a clique. And um, now I'm just going to show you my generic picture here. But the idea is that, again, that a clique is very high in conformity and consistency because the activity is chosen first or the behavior is chosen first and then you choose people who, who match along. And so you tend to get people, for instance, who look very similar, who act very similar. Now, it's interesting to think that whether a sports team counts as a clique because, yeah, you choose the activity first and then you all kind of look the same and do the same. But I think we're talking about uh, other social circumstances. Anyhow, these people don't look especially the same to me, except they're all kind of dressed in nice pastel -y colors, but yeah, whatever. All right, uh, question number 10. Which of the following has been found to be the most prevalent reason for teen pregnancy? So why do teenagers get pregnant? They did not realize the risk they took. They had a troubled home life and wanted a new family. They wanted to keep their boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever. They wanted to show their independence and defy their parents. Well, you know, several of those actually sound ambitious, like they got something going on. But the correct answer in this case is they just didn't know what they were doing. Um, it's shocking how many kids don't realize that by having sex, they might actually get the thing that results only from having sex. And uh, that's having kids. By the way, I thought I'd throw in a little chart here in terms of... Um, Holy Moses, there's the U.S. We got a lot of pregnant teenagers compared down to Switzerland, which is about one-eighth, one-tenth of what we've got. It's um, it's crazy. Anyhow, um, that is it for the first online quiz for Chapter 6 on Adolescence and Lifespan Development. Thanks for watching.